Dean Martin was one of a kind, the child of working class Italian immigrants. This shy, stammering boy grew up to be a boxer, a comedian, a singer, an actor, and everything in between. But it didn't all come easy to the king of cool. Dean Martin cultivated the image of a hard partying, heavy drinking playboy and kept it up for years. But then, always a heavy smoker, he was told he had lung cancer. After he received the diagnosis, his family was heartbroken, but their nightmare was just beginning. Dean Martin was born Dino Paul Crocetti on June 7th, 1917 in Ohio. Bullied at school for his broken English and Italian accent, he dropped out as soon as he could to work with his father at a steel mill. But that didn't last long either. Dino soon realised that there were more opportunities to make money on the other side of the law. He bootlegged liquor during Prohibition, which put him into contact with some shady characters. All those years defending himself against bullies in school set him in good stead to try his hand at prize fighting, going by the name Kid Crochet, which actually sounds kinda cosy and lovely. But fighting in the ring was one thing. He soon found an even more brutal way to make a quick buck. Dean Martin struck out on his own and moved into a New York City apartment with another young Italian named Sonny King. Both of them dreamed of a life in show business, but for now, they were just two young punks who needed rent money. With limited education and skills, Martin and King did the obvious thing and ran a secret fight club out of their apartment. They'd charge New Yorkers to come and watch them bare knuckle box, fighting until one of them knocked the other out. Deciding that he preferred to keep his teeth in his actual mouth, Martin landed a gig working in an illicit speakeasy slash casino. He worked roulette tables, dealt cards and entertained the guests. Now that sounds a little more like the Dean Martin we know. The shady lounges of speakeasies showed this tough Italian American teenager a new world and he liked it. He was used to putting on a show and he quickly learned that singing was a lot more fun than getting punched in the face. He started singing at whatever clubs he could, legal or not. He would mimic crooners like Perry Como and the people liked it. Soon he sang with a popular local band, earning steady paychecks and making a name for himself. The only problem was he was making the wrong name. The world didn't yet know Dean Martin. They barely even knew Dino Crocetti. He started going by Dino Martini, but the same anti-Italian sentiment that ruined school for him once again reared its ugly head. Sadly, the name Dino Martini was holding him back and the leader of the band, Sammy Watkins, knew it. He told young Dino he should go by Dean Martin and the rest is history. Dean Martin was on the road to stardom, a road that would see him become a Hollywood legend and ultimately end in tragedy. Martin married for the first time at 24 years old. Her name was Betty McDonald and she married Dino Crocetti, the young and upcoming lounge singer. The pair of them had four children together, but this was no fairy tale marriage. As Dino Crocetti became Dean Martin, their relationship started to tear at the seams. In the mid 1940s, Dean Martin found himself in the same lineup as a boisterous young comic at New York's Glass Hat Club. The kid's name was Jerry Lewis, and right away, Martin could tell there was something special about him. Neither of them knew it at the time, but this was the start of a beautiful friendship. And a bitter feud. The pair decided to work together, and they debuted Martin and Lewis in Atlantic City in 1946. It was the birth of one of the greatest duos show business had ever seen, and it was a total, unmitigated disaster. Whatever Martin and Lewis prepared, the crowd wasn't having it. The pair bombed so hard that the club's owner told them they had to come up with a better act before their second show of the night or he'd fire them. That's how Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis ended up huddling in a dark alley behind the club, frantically trying to think up anything that could save them. Instead of coming up with a whole new show, they decided to just wing it. They threw everything they had at the audience. Martin sang songs, Lewis performed skits, and the pair of them ad-libbed banter throughout. Now, if that sounds like a complete train wreck, well, maybe it would have been if it were two regular performers, but this was Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. The crowd went nuts. 
and the duo never looked back. This complete Hail Mary quickly transformed into a successful act that sent Martin and Lewis all over the eastern seaboard, eventually bringing their act to New York's legendary Copacabana. This was no small time club, they'd reached the big time. After that, there was only one place to go next. It was about time the whole world discovered Dean Martin. Martin and Lewis made their TV debut in 1948 on The Ed Sullivan Show to a rapturous reception. They were both ready to take their act out of nightclubs and into TV and film. But while Dean Martin's career was rising, his marriage was going up in flames. It seems that Betty MacDonald preferred the struggling Dino Crocetti to the successful Dean Martin. They divorced in 1949 with Martin gaining full custody of their four children. MacDonald, it seems, wasn't cut out for the spotlight. She lived out the rest of her days in obscurity in San Francisco. Meanwhile, Dean Martin's star continued to rise, and he wasted no time finding a new woman to fill the void. He married Jean Beeger, a former Orange Bowl queen, mere months after his divorce. Jean proved to be Martin's longest love, and they remained married for nearly 25 years, though it wasn't all wedded bliss. For now, Martin had his career to focus on, and he was about to enter a whole new world. 1949 was a busy year for Dean Martin. He got divorced, got married, and appeared in his first movie, My Friend Irma. Though he and Lewis earned $75,000 between them for the film, that was peanuts compared to what was coming next. Their agent negotiated one of the best deals in Hollywood history, allowing them to produce one film a year over which they'd have complete control. They also had final say over all nightclub, radio, TV and record appearances. That deal netted them millions. This dynamic duo was quickly on their way to conquering Hollywood, but this was when the cracks started to show. No one could deny the chemistry between Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis on stage, but when the curtain fell, it was a different story. While Lewis always got to be the funny man, Martin felt trapped by always playing the straight man. He wanted to mix up their formula, but Lewis refused. Martin grew more and more bitter. The relationship grew tense and uncomfortable. Dean Martin played second fiddle to nobody, but that was quickly becoming how people saw him. Critics heaped praise on Jerry Lewis and claimed that he was the real talent. Martin seethed while Lewis basked in the adulation, unconcerned and unsympathetic. Finally, while promoting their latest film, 1954's Living It Up, something happened that finally pushed Martin too far. Even Dean Martin grew jealous sometimes, and the critics weren't helping matters. But after the duo's 1954 photo shoot for Look magazine, he'd finally had enough. The pair of them posed for the promotional shoot, but when Martin saw the final cover, his blood ran cold. They'd completely cropped him out of the photo, leaving only Lewis on the cover. Martin was completely ready to move on, but the pair still had to finish making their last movie together, Hollywood or Bust. Despite their playful attitude on screen, the set became excruciatingly awkward. Martin and Lewis both refused to speak to the other whenever the cameras weren't rolling. So was Martin just being a baby or was Lewis being a diva? Well, years later, Lewis would finally reveal the truth. In his memoirs, Lewis placed the blame squarely on his own shoulders. The 50s saw him become one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, and all that success went straight to his head. He treated the people around him like dirt, Martin included. Hollywood or Bust, while not particularly great on screen, was even more of a nightmare behind the scenes. Martin's complete disinterest led to more and more vicious arguments with Lewis. Finally, Martin snapped. He looked his old partner in the eye and said, To me, you're nothing but a f***ing dollar sign. They broke up for good in 1956, exactly 10 years after they first teamed up. Lewis likely assumed Martin would be lost without him. He never could have imagined what came next. Hang with that shake, Martin and Lewis or Amos and Andy? Martin and Lewis. Lucky for Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis wasn't his only friend in show business. He also happened to know another popular lounge singer, one whom he'd met back in the 40s when he was still struggling. As Martin's solo career grew, he and Frank Sinatra became friends. 
In the late 50s and early 60s, Martin and Sinatra formed the Rat Pack, named after an earlier social circle of Hollywood A-listers, the Holmby Hills Rat Pack, who would hang out at the home of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. With Sinatra and Martin at the centre, this legendary group of performers included Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford and Joey Bishop, among others. Their charm, style and banter made them legends, and they knew the perfect place to take their act. The Rat Pack just wouldn't be the same without Las Vegas. On any given night you might see one, two or all of them take the stage at one glamorous casino or another. The Rat Pack reached their height in the 1960s while America was changing. Despite their clean cut appearance and charm, the group pushed boundaries in ways no one expected. Their jokes revolved around taboo themes like Martin's heavy drinking and Sinatra's constant womanising. The group also delved into the world of politics, supporting the civil rights movement and refusing to perform at clubs that barred African American or Jewish performers. Martin had made his name next to Jerry Lewis, and then next to the Rat Pack, so it was time for him to set out on his own. The Dean Martin Show began its 264 episode run in 1965. He completely improvised every show, which often set him down scandalous tangents. His off-the-cuff use of Italian curse words were charming to most American viewers, but NBC received a deluge of complaints from people who spoke the language. The network tried its best to rein him in, but come on, does this look like the kind of guy who can be reined in? Despite the controversies, Martin was so popular he could continue doing whatever he wanted, and what he wanted to do was less. When he renegotiated his contract, he included a clause that meant he didn't have to attend rehearsals. He improvised every show anyway, so he struck a deal that let him spend the whole week on the golf course, only showing up for tapings. By this point, he had an infamous reputation as a drinker, and his antics only added fuel to the rumours, but that wasn't the whole picture. Dean Martin was America's most lovable drunk, from the glass of scotch that remained in his hand throughout all his performances, to his vanity license plate, Drunky. Everyone knew that Martin was the Rat Pack's booze hound, but actually, the drink in his hand on stage was apple juice more often than not, and he was usually the first to call it quits at parties, preferring to spend time at home with his family. The whole lovable drunk shtick was an act, but the problem was he was too good of an actor. He played an alcoholic so convincingly in movies like Some Came Running and Rio Bravo that the tabloids started writing about his not-so-secret addiction. When he became a singer, Dean Martin left his shady past as a bootlegger and bare-knuckle boxer behind, but that life still stalked him at every turn. His pal Frank Sinatra had mob connections all across the country, and the Rat Pack often performed for gangsters. One of the most infamous mobsters connected to the Rat Pack was Meyer Lansky, and Lansky had a beautiful daughter, Sandra. You can see where this is going. Though Martin managed to maintain a squeaky clean reputation throughout most of his life, years later Sandra dropped a bombshell in her memoirs. She claimed to have had a passionate affair with longtime family man Dean Martin. The details that emerged were pretty scandalous. According to Lansky, her affair with Martin occurred while his wife was pregnant with their daughter Gina. She claimed that the pair had an unspoken pact to never discuss their families when they were together, so she didn't know about it until later. For decades, Dean Martin seemed on a constant upward trajectory. In 1972, however, he began to fall back to earth. He filed for divorce from his wife of over 20 years. And just a week after that, the Riviera and Las Vegas cancelled their contract with him because they thought he was too demanding. Now 55, Martin was in the midst of a full-blown midlife crisis. And what do men who are having a midlife crisis do? Checks notes? Oh yes, they make terrible mistakes. Dean Martin was clearly a husband kind of guy. He'd married Jean less than a year after his first divorce, and this time around he wasted even less time. Less than a month after his 24-year marriage ended, he wed Catherine Hahn, the receptionist at a Beverly Hills hair salon. He was 55 and she was 26. Uh, a tale as old as time. And they lived happily ever after. Right? Oh wait, no, they divorced less than three years later. 
Clearly Martin was having some woman troubles, but in the midst of all that, he was about to rekindle one of the most important relationships of his life. Martin hadn't spoken to Jerry Lewis in 20 years, so Frank Sinatra came up with a devious plan to change that. During a telethon for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, Sinatra stunned Lewis by bringing Dino out on stage. Listen, I have a, I have a friend who loves what you do every year and who just wanted to come out. Would you send my friend out, please? Where is he? We just send him out here, come here. The duo were never as close as they'd once been, but they maintained a healthy friendship for the rest of Martin's life. Despite his onstage persona, Dean Martin was a family man, first and foremost. He had eight children whom he loved and supported. He named his first son with his second wife after himself, and young Dean Paul Martin soon grew into the apple of his father's eye. He sang and acted just like his pops. He also played professional tennis, and as if that wasn't enough, he even became a fighter pilot. Dino brought immeasurable joy into his dad's life, which made his terrible end all the more devastating. On March 21st, 1986, the 35-year-old Dean Paul Martin took part in a routine training mission over the California desert. During the exercise, his plane disappeared from the radar over a particularly cloudy mountain range and the son of one of America's most popular entertainers was missing and the search was on. Search helicopters and planes spent days scouring the mountains for any sign of Dino's plane but came up with nothing. Ronald Reagan, then president but also a longtime friend of Martin's, even sent the nation's most advanced spy plane to join the search. Meanwhile, Martin sat at home, praying for the news that the search parties had found his son alive. Martin was willing to do anything to find his son. He even hired two psychics to help in the search. One of those psychics pointed them towards San Gorgonio Mountain. Three days after the plane went down, the search party approached the mountain and found what they had been looking for. Dean Paul Martin's aircraft lay demolished on the mountainside. There were no survivors. Anyone close to Martin could tell that he just wasn't the same after his son passed. He was depressed, demoralised and defeated. Sinatra, still seeking any way to help him, dragged him along on a massive stadium tour, hoping to take his mind off his grief. Unfortunately, the plan backfired horribly. Sinatra thought the adoring crowds would shake Martin out of his stupor, but they had the opposite effect. Martin vastly preferred smaller nightclub audiences and he felt disconnected to the sea of faces in large stadiums. Old Blue Eyes still wanted to party until dawn as they had in the 60s, but Martin was old, tired and depressed. The tour had barely begun and Martin was already at his breaking point. After a show in New York City, Frank was ready to party, but Martin had no interest in reliving the old days. Later that same night, he got on his private jet and flew back to LA, leaving his friends to continue the tour without him. After his son's passing, Martin put his career on the back burner and spent as much time as possible with his growing family. Unfortunately, he didn't have that much time left. Martin may have walked the stage with apple juice in his glass, but the smokes were real. In September 93, doctors at Cedars Sinai diagnosed him with lung cancer. They told him that he needed surgery immediately to prolong his life. To his family's dismay, Martin refused the surgery and resigned himself to his fate. He retired from public appearances at the start of 95 and spent his final year with family and friends. He succumbed to acute respiratory failure at his Beverly Hills home on Christmas Day 1995 at the age of 78. Not much can dim the bright lights of the Las Vegas Strip, but the passing of Dean Martin did it. The casinos where he'd tread the stage for so many years all brought their lights low in his honour, a fitting tribute to the King of Cool. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more.